Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from Alchemy by Marie Louise von Franz, and I'll be reading chapter four, the first part of it. But first, these acknowledgments. This book is based on the transcription by Miss Una Thomas of the lecture series presented by Dr. von Franz at the C.G. Jung Institute, Zurich, in 1959. The author and publisher are grateful to Miss Thomas for her faithful preparation of the original version. The text in its present form was edited for publication by Daryl Sharp and Marion Woodman. Daryl Sharp selected the illustrations, wrote the captions, and compiled the index. So uh, chapter four begins with an image. Uh, so I will share that image for you. It's quite ra raucous or whatever you want to call it, raunchy perhaps. Uh, the fallen Adam as prima materia showing the phallus, the creative masculine as a living tree. Okay. You can go back to the video and uh, stop the video if you want to study that one in greater detail. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, Art. Nice to see you. And uh, hello, Allison. Uh, welcome. Okay. Lecture four, Greek slash Arabic alchemy. We stopped last time while discussing a very obscure passage in the Olympi Olympiodorus text. The recipe from which he quotes said that one should take the chrysocolla, the golden stone, which was called the male, together with the needed man, which obviously refers to Adam, who was kneaded uh, or molded out of clay. Thus, there is indirectly a reference to Adam in paradise, which would be confirmed by the fact that Zosimos was known to Olympiodorus. As you know, the psychology of alchemy, as you know, in psychology and alchemy, there is reference to a Zosimos text which speaks of Adam mm -hmm. as having been created in paradise from the four elements and afterward having fallen into the world. The task of alchemy, according to Zosimos, consists in reassembling the light sparks of Adam and bringing him back to paradise. Olympiodorus, who lived 200 years later, knew of this Zosimos text so quite obviously the reference here is to the reassembling of Adam, to restoring the fallen Adam, to Lot who lives as a light spark in every human being to the heavenly realm. Therefore, our text is a variation of the idea that a bottom in matter, that at bottom in matter there is in an extended and dissolved form or in the cosmic figure of a human being, Adam, the first man called under different names, who was to be liberated or redeemed from matter. I, I refer you to that part of psychology and alchemy concerning the fallen Adam, the fallen anima or man, where Dr. Jung refers to different texts showing that this mirrors the process of projection. If you remember, he says that the myth of an angel or Adam or of a cosmic anima figure falling into matter represents the moment when this figure is projected into matter, which means that such theories which come from the unconscious in alchemy bring in the idea that suddenly the symbol of the self is consciously sought for in matter. This is clearly so for our earlier text referred to the funeral rite of Osiris and all funeral rituals in the Egyptian sense of the word. 
the search for immortality was actually the search for an incorruptible essence in man, which would survive death, an essential part of the human being, which could be preserved. Thus, the search for immortality for the eternal in man is to be found at the very beginning of alchemy. We can say that the emotional drive and interest in the phenomenon of matter was not a modern scientific interest in the sense of curiosity as to what matter looked like, but that, but that what gave the impulse and libido for the search to understand the mystery of matter was a real emotional drive and desire to find the immortal part of man. This search continued till practically the 17th century with all the later theories of the elixir of life, the pharmacon of life, and so on. Something immortal which would survive death, translated into modern psychological terms, could be expressed as an aspect of the self, the search for the greater incorruptible and essential part of man. The next part of the text deals with the bringing up of the gold by the ants from the Ethiopian earth. Behind that is the myth of the Aramaspians of India. For both countries, India and Ethiopia, at that time carried the projection of being the countries where miracles took place as well as being those of the greatest piety. In the late Greek Alexander novels, there are many pseudo letters of Alexander the Great to his mother, Olympias, where he speaks of India and says that there, that there Brahmins walk about naked and are the wisest men on earth and the most pious. This same idea was also projected into Ethiopia. In the late geographic in the late geographical novels and reports in Greek, it is always said that the black Ethiopian people are the closest to God and the most pious people in the world. I can also, it can also be said that the Greeks through their intellectual ev evolution lost a certain aspect of primitive religion, that immediate primitive religious attitude, which as far as we can see is common to all primitive civilizations. A study of primitive civilization shows their religious attitude towards life as being something completely self-evident. Religion was not separated from the profane everyday life, but the self-evident basis of everything done, believed and said. In his primitive condition, man is naturally religious and his religion pervades his whole nature and all his activities. Greek civilization had evolved from that state through the pre-Socratic and the sophistic philosophy and the various evolutions of Greek philosophy. The upper layer of learned people in Greece, perhaps for the first time, had cut away the primitive religious attitude, which was then projected first onto the Indians and Ethiopians, and later, according to late Greek literature, onto the Egyptians and such people who were then considered to be the highest and closest to God. And in their realm, our text says, the alchemical mystery was to be found. A return to the primitive self-evident attitude towards life is a requisite for the experience of the self, which cannot be found, uh, which cannot be found through the conscious mind and with the developed part of the personality, but by first returning to that primitive human attitude. The text goes on, then put with the gold which the ants bring up, the wife or the woman of the vapor, till it comes out, i.e., the divine bitter water. So here there is the motif of a communio. You take the gold which has been brought up out of Ethiopian earth, the male substance, and put it with a female substance which is called the woman of the vapor, 
or the steam. Question, would the pr primitive religious attitude have to do with participation mystique? Dr. Van Franz, yes, it has all the symptoms of primitive religion, namely participation mystique. Observation of synchronistic events, observation of signs, not acting without first observing inner and outer symptoms and signs, or as it has been defined, the constant careful attention towards unknown factors. According to that definition, religion means never acting only in accordance with conscious reasoning, but with the constant attention and consideration of the unknown participating factors. For instance, if someone says, let us have coffee together after the lecture, if I think only I have time, if I think only I have time since I don't have lunch until 1230, that would be conscious reasoning, which of course is also correct. But if I am a religious person, I will stop for a minute and try to get a feeling as to whether it is right to do that. And if I have an instinctive feeling against it, or that, or at that moment, a window bangs shut, or I stumble, then I might not go. One can laugh at the, that as superstition, and naturally on that level, it is different from superstition, but it is not just a mechanical thing, such as the idea that if a black cat crosses your path, you should turn back, but rather that all the time one should concentrate and try to get some sign from the self or from inside oneself. In Chinese philosophy, it is tantamount to paying constant attention to Tao. Whether what I am now doing is right in Tao, whether what I am now doing it is right in Tao, Naturally, there are also personal arguments, the pros and cons, but to live in a religious way would mean being constantly on the alert for those unknown powers, which also guide one's life. If I get no contrary indication, I can decide to have coffee since I have time or because I like it. A bell does not always ring warning us, but if it does and one ignores it, then something goes wrong. The religious and primitive attitude involves constant consideration of these powers. When Dr. Jung was in Africa, his safari guide was an Islamic, I believe a Shiite. At breakfast every morning, all the black carriers discussed their dreams, after which the leader of the group would go to Dr. Jung and say, that they would proceed or not on that day. Dr. Jung found that when they said they were not going, the general aspect of the dreams had, been, had not been favorable. So they felt probably they should stay another day before proceeding. Dr. Jung accepted such decisions and even managed to be drawn into the discussion on dreams and take part in it and they were very much impressed to find that he knew something about and was interested in dreams and could even interpret them better. And like, and like that, he could observe what was happening. But an Englishman who went to the same place some weeks later naturally did as, mo as most white men do. He accused the men of being lazy and insisted that they had, they had to arrive at their destination in five days time and used force and he was killed. The one illustration, the one illustrates the attitude of careful consideration of all the irrational aspects. The natives act like, acted, the natives acted like that because there might be a day when there were thunderstorms or one might meet a rhinoceros and be attacked and so on. In nature, one is constantly confronted with such things and our unconscious does know about them. And when one is living in wild nature, attention to such factors 
is essential to survival. Animals always receive warning about earthquakes and other dangers. They get them instinctively. And if we pay attention, we believe, we believe them also through our dreams, which is why those natives in an adapted and reasonable way paid attention to their dreams every morning. I had an illustration of something like this the other day when I was at my holiday home. There was obviously a thunderstorm coming up from the upper part of the lake. Naturally, I did not know that it would hail, but my dog suddenly put her ears back and rushed into the house and up to the top floor and hit her head in my bed. I rushed after her to see why she behaved in that way. And at that moment, down came the hail. Animals have such warnings by a kind of telepathy. But really, telep telepathy only means being aware of something far away, and that explains nothing, for telepathy is only a word. We only know that in the unconscious instinctive functioning of higher animals, including men, there is a supernatural, or better said, a super rational awareness of things that about which we could not know rationally. And that therefore it is helpful, healthy, and very important to pay attention to such impulses. They seem not only to work for the survival of the animals and human beings, but to have further extension namely the, that of working for the higher development and maturity and the psychological welfare of the person, which is what we call, uncon call the unconscious in its preserving and healing aspect. Religion in our definition, in, in its most basic form, would simply be constant alert attention directed toward these facts, instead of ruling and deciding one's life by conscious rational decision and re reasoning of the pros and cons. Therefore, in primitive societies, religion pervades everyday life. Before primitives go hunting, there is a hunting ritual, and if during it there is an accident, they don't go. There is nothing either mystical or transcendent or special about it. The basic religious attitude is linked with the idea of survival and therefore to be religious is an immediate advantage for it ensures survival. When we are confronted with the phenomenon of neurosis, when people get stuck in their difficulties, we try to discover what the unconscious has to say and to let analysis are first guided to attend to attend more to their instincts behind which is the whole phenomenon of religious insight and experience. Dr. Jung, of course, began as well. Dr. Jung, of course, began as all doctors did on the basis also of his contact with Freud, with the idea of helping people to become more instinctive in order that they might be healthy. But then he discovered that behind instinct was also religion, or that the latter was something instinctive and completely natural. For the natural man is the religious man. One therefore has to return to the natural, immediate man within and to a religious attitude, for we cannot have one without the other. Question, does the word religion come from relegare or relegare? The last three letters are either A-R-E or E-R-E. Um, yeah. Dr. Von Franz, there's been an etymological, etymological dispute as to whether the word religio comes from relegare or relegare. Naturally, both have the same root, legare, to pick up, 
Originally, it referred to picking up or collecting wood, but Legera to read has another connection, namely one picks up or gathers together the individual letters. That is how people read at first and how children still learn. Relegare has been, this is relegare, I suppose. Relegare has been accepted as the official interpretation since the time of St. Augustine with the theological reflection that it means to bind, to bind one back to God. So St. Augustine said man had been severed from God through original sin and that the task of religion was to bind him back again. That obviously is not a scientific interpretation, but it is very interesting and a good reflection of the Christian idea of religion. Modern etymologists, modern etymologists think that probably it comes from the word religare, um, which would mean careful consideration on which I have given amplifications, for example, alertness in regard to irrational factors, but they are in the word itself, which simply means careful consideration. The ray indicates backwards. So it means that one looks backward to find out whether what is behind is coming, is coming to or if it is doubtful, one has always to watch and ascertain that the other forces have to stay about. I'm sorry. One has always to watch and ascertain what the other forces have to say about our lives. Question, could that be said to be just superstition? Dr. Van Frans, no. Superstition would be the mechanization of this attitude. Generally, one thinks of superstition when one knocks on, knocks on wood or when one says that, he, that to see a black cat means bad luck or that a spider in the morning is depressing and a bad sign. All that can be true, but if applied mechanically, if careful consideration of the signs becomes codified, then superstition comes in. A spider, indica a spider indicates spinning, the spinning of fantasies. The superstition in that, the superstition is that in the moment, a spider means bad luck. In the moment a spider means bad luck and in the evening, good luck. Obviously that really means that if in the morning out one is slack and sleepy, gets up late and sits about half dressed and just thinks of one's neurotic problems, that would be the spider in the morning and would certainly bring bad luck. But if, but if after working all day, one lights a cigarette in the evening and sits in front of the house as peasants do and lets one's fantasies run, or if one philosophizes about life, if one philosophizes about life, that is quite all right. It is a, it is a very good way to prepare oneself for sleep. Therefore, the spider in the evening is propitious, and that probably was original meaning of this widespread and widespread superstition. The spider is the negative mother symbol. It is the Maya and so on. When it comes into the evening or at the evening of life, it is all right, but it is very bad to start the day with it. Hypnotizing myself. Okay, there's another image here, so I'll share that.
Okay. Uh, st- uh, figure 27, spider is symbol of the Maya weaver of a fantasy world. When it comes in the evening or at the evening of life, it is all but right. It is all right, but it is very bad to start the day with it, according to von Franz. It would be amusing if one of us were to write a thesis on common superstitions and what they mean symbolically. That would be highly interesting, and I propose the theme to anyone who does not know what to write write upon, namely just to take some of the ordinary superstitions and analyze them, for they are very meaningful. It is only mechanical application that is superstition in the bad sense of the word. That is just a stupid habit and has nothing to do with the religious attitude. Now in our text with the male substances, put the vapor wife or the woman who consists of vapor until the bitter water comes out. That is the conjunction of male and female and the the child is bitter divine water. The wife is characterized as vapor uh, other texts show that in general, vapor or steam is regarded as the psyche of matter. Even at even up to 2010, or I'm sorry, even up to 1910, in the Swiss military service, a short course used to be given on general medicine, just to teach people about the bones and the circulation of the blood and so on. And one teacher said that the brain was like a cup full of macaroni and that the steam above it was the soul. He had, he had got into the old alchemical pattern. You could say that that fantasy was 2000 years old for an, for an old text. And out, for an old text on alchemy, the idea of steam or vapor always carried the idea of psyche, of, sublima- of sublimated matter. And that uh, subtle body, something half material. In parapsychological reports, if a ghost appears, there is first something like stream or a nebula. So it can also So it can be said that one of the most archetypal ideas is that the psyche has to do with the quality of steam or vapor, which expresses the idea. That is somehow linked with it, but not identical to solid matter there is probably a certain anima function in, a, in it for this text was probably written by a man. Just look at your questions here a minute. Yeah, I think that's That's right, big cat. Okay, reading on. After the union of male substance with vapor came the divine bitter water. The word divine is in Greek, theos. Okay. The word divine is in Greek, theos, which also means sulfur, so that it can be translated as the divine water, which is the generally accepted official translation, or as sulfur water, since sulfur was regarded as being a divine substance. It is the water or the liquid of the divine substance. 
water in general, including urine, uh, uh, carries the projection of knowledge. In medieval church symbolism, they spoke of the aqua doctrinaire and in the Swiss dialect, if something comes out with a lot of nonsense, just a lot of words, we say he is urinating. <laughs> Psychogenic kidney troubles were often said to be with people being filled up with such bad water for they have not the right attitude or the right connection with knowledge. They just blather, they just blather a lot uh, of undigested knowledge and that is like urinating. So usually it can be said that water has to do with the knowledge extracted from the unconscious, which can either be misused or used positively. Okay, just have to clear my hypnosis here as I get into hypnosis when I'm reading. Okay. Um, uh, okay, in alchemy, water was either the great healing factor or poisonous and destructive. Usually we interpret water as the unconscious and differentiate the specific meaning according to the context. If in a patient's dream, water is rising, or if there is a big inundation, then we would say, be careful, the unconscious is overwhelming us. Uh, there the water would be negative. But on the other hand, if you are in the desert and thirsty, then it is water of life. Christ is the well of life and there are various other similes uh, you may know. In fact, all religions, all religions, water is the fifth substance, or is the life substance, sorry, which boils down to the fact that the extinction of the animus, anima, or what, or that watery knowledge is what takes place in the interpretation of a psychological situation or a dream. Clear this now. If someone comes with a problem, instead of arguing with that person, we look at the dream which comments on the situation. Perhaps it can be interpreted in such a way as to vivify the other person and give a feeling of hope and a sense of the problem as having a hidden meaning, even though it may not yet be clear. In such a case, knowledge obtained from the unconscious has the quality of the water of life, for that person has as it were, drunk of the water of life and will go away with the feeling that now something is flowing and the period of stagnation is over. Then there is a certain tension until the next analytic hour. For the analysand wonders how the inner adventure will continue so that life gets a new start and flows once again. Jim says, how about a whole essay on a for on the fortune cookie? Well, we could certainly do that, but that's not today's task. Goods and bads, me thinks, yes. Okay. Hi, Neil. Okay, going on. On the other hand, we have all seen people drowned in the unconscious, namely schizoid or borderline cases, or people in a psychotic episode who talk knowledge of the unconscious. 
they sit in bed and in their cells in the asylum and talk of the creation of the world and of what God is and what should be done to save the world, saying that the doctors in the asylum are all fools and that they know better and so on. That is knowledge of the unconscious. It is water and it is even full of wisdom. But the speaker's head is under the, under the water and the knowledge has got the person and not the person, the knowledge. That poor person is literally drowned in the wisdom of the unconscious. He does not want to get out for, for he fears, he feels wisdom of the unconscious for he feels that he is drowning, is drowned in something very good and very marvelous, which is why most refuse to be cured. Seen from the reasonable standpoint, that is a very bad condition uh, to be in for such people become so unadapted that they have to uh, be confined. They have too much of the water of life, although what they say is not nonsense. If you have sufficient symbolic language, you can understand what the psychotic person says from A to Z, and just as though it were everyday talk. In our text, we have the normal situation, namely that the divine water was to be produced as a result of the communio which in psychological terms would be what we do every day. We unite our conscious mind with the unconscious. For instance, in the interpretation of dreams by what we get into, uh, by what we get this vivifying knowledge, uh, the sense of understanding, and that would be the water. Now, here, the water is spoken of as bitter. Why? Answer, because of it is the truth. Well, France, yes, naturally. Very often we have not a very happy reaction, but the contrary. For often the truth given by the unconscious is very bitter. It is a better pill to swallow because it contains very obvious criticisms of our attitudes, and that is a better experience. The accounts have, the, the accounts for the resistance against psychology for very many people do not want to take a better pill. They may be a little vague as to Sorry, I'm uh, having a little hypnosis problem. I'm gonna go back to where I know I was reading. It is a bitter pill to swallow because it contains very obvious criticisms of our attitudes and that is a bitter experience. That accounts for the resistance against psychology, for very many people do not want to take the bitter pill. They have a vague feeling of being badly off the track and that they could only return to health by swallowing certain criticism. They are determined to fight if the criticism comes from outside, but it is very awkward if the criticism comes from within. Then the analyst can just wash his hands of it and say he is sorry, but it is the analyst's own dream and not something the analyst has said, and then he has to swallow it. The text continues that the philosopher Patasios also speaks of the work in the same way, saying that the sphere of the fire is kept down by the lead. The same philosopher interpreting himself says that this is from the male water. Olympia Doris says that the male water therefore seems to have the same thing as the sphere of fire. 
which in the earlier case of the text, we saw, uh, we saw what, which in the earlier part of the text we saw was the tomb of Osiris uh, who suffocated in the lead. Therefore we have Osiris, the sphere of fire and male water and all three are suffocated in the lead, the enemy. In the knowledge of late antiquity, lead was the metal of the planet, Saturn, and had some qualities. On the negative side, depression and positively creation, dep creative depression, Sat Saturn is the god of mutilated people criminals and cripples, but also of artistic and creative people in our modern language, that would mean the strange quality in certain depressions in which one feels literally like lead without thinking of these alchemical symbolisms. People often say, today I feel like lead. In a heavy depression, one feels unable to get from one's chair or even open one's mouth to explain uh, that one is depressed. One case, uh, one just case, one just sits like a black or a heavy of heavy metal. One just sits like a block of heavy metal matter. One just sits like a block of heavy matter. Confessions of people in such a state have innumerable lead similes. As the word implies, in a depression, the person is depressed down, compressed, usually because a part of the psychological libido is below and has to be fetched up. The real energy of life has fallen into a deeper layer of the personality and can only be reached through can only be reached through depression. So unless there is a latent psychosis, a depression should be encouraged and people told to do, to go into it and be depressed, not try to escape by the radio or the Reader's Digest. And if the depression says that the life means nothing and that nothing is worthwhile, then accept that then accept that and say, what about, what about it? Listens go deeper and deeper until you again reach the level of the psychological energy where some, where some creative idea can count, where some creative idea can come up and suddenly at the bottoms at the, uh, at the bottom, an impulse of life and creativeness, which has been overlooked, may appear. Okay, just, uh, just look at some of your thoughts here, because uh, this is just putting me to sleep. I hope this is helping with your afternoon naps, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Justin says, just wrote an article about it. It all changed when the Christian Ju Judea Judaic religion claimed that we were the masters of nature, a superior being created in the image of God. Uh, and later, Renaissance philosophers and early scientists, uh, such as Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton, promoted the idea that intelligence is what defines us and the key to the to master nature. Neil, I am so tired today. The world seems like it's changing, something going on. The clouds are lower, close to uh, like a blanket. No birds in the sky, very quiet in the mornings. People more strange, distant. Uh, Neil, private thoughts, Skip. Uh, yes, well, we're certainly going through uh, the negredo uh, in our society in, uh, 
and I I had a start on looking at the um, at the serialization of Isaac Asimov's book Foundation, and I found it quite interesting. The first episode um, really sounds like Asimov, Asimov really read and clearly understood Dr. Young's uh, fundamental principles. Um, and I'm interested, at, I'm looking forward to watching more of it because uh, he might know something, who knows? Um, and so here we're getting into this, um, this area that you're just asking about. It can also be pre-psychotic symptom as psychiatrists well know, what comes up afterwards is also a creative content, but it wells up to such an extent that it can destroy the personality. In such cases, one must think twice before encouraging the person to go into the depression because though the mechanism is the same, there is the risk that what comes up may be too strong and burst the personality. Lead is therefore that heaviness, listlessness, that feeling of nothingness, which covers up or suffocates the contents of the unconscious. As the text, which I gave you briefly in the last hour says, there is in this lead even the element of madness. This refers to another fact for if you dig up depressive states in people, usually at the bottom there are either creative contents or a violent unsacrificed desire. Frequently depressed people dream of voracious lions or other devouring animals such as dragons, but particularly lions, which means they are depressed because they're frustrated in the fulfillment of their wild desires. They want everything to be top dog, have the most beautiful partner, money, and everything else. They have the childish wild desires, which would like to eat everything up. But at the same time, they are intelligent enough to know that life is not like that, that they cannot have what they want. So the desire curls up into sulky depressiveness. Such a depression has the quality of sulkily uh, frustrated desire and explains why after an unhappy love affair, people drop into an awful depression. Their, their lion has been frustrated and has returned sulking to its lair. I'll give you another image here. Well, first of all, let me show you this one, which I think I didn't give you earlier. Okay, so the con conjunctio, union of opposites, as harmonious interplay between male water and female fire. And then the lion, the alchemical green lion devouring the sun relates to the experience of consciousness being overwhelmed by violent, frustrated desires often masked by depression. Some people have a frustrated infant within them. Usually they are very correct and polite and make very few demands on the analyst, but being too polite and correct and considerate is always suspect. One knows that they would like to eat up the analyst completely like the lion, making childish demands and scenes because the analyst has stopped five minutes before the time or answered the telephone or put off the hour or even had the flu. Such demanding infantile people compensate by being very correct, knowing that if they admit their demands, then the devouring lion will come up and the analyst will naturally hit back, something which they have experienced often in life when after hiding their feelings, uh, they one day took the risk and as a result got banged on, got banged on the head. So the hurt child retires once more, bitterly frustrated, and then comes the depression and the devouring lion. That is a part of primitive nature, 
of primitive archaic reactions, which have all the conflicts of wanting to eat and not being able to do so, so that the depressive mania takes over. Okay, have we seen that recently in our politics? I wonder. <laughs> The Autumn People Thrives uh, by pricking of my thoughts, something wicked this way comes from Macbeth by William Shakespeare, scene four, act one. Okay. <clears throat> that is the symbolism of ma madness in the lead, uh, in the lead. That is the symbolism of madness in the lead but it, is also, it, all, it also contains Osiris, the immortal man. And if only you accept that spot within you, you will come to the creative content where the self is hidden. The frustrated child could be said to be an aspect covering up an image of the self and the devouring lion also an aspect of the self. If you take the image of the devouring lion, this is quite clear. If I think I ought to be top dog everywhere, have the most beautiful partner, have money, be happy and so on, that is a paradise fantasy. And what is that? It is the projection of the self. So actually the childish thing is the desire to experience everything in the here and now. The fantasy in itself is entirely legitimate. It has the idea of the conjunctio, a perfect state, a state of harmony. It is a religious idea, but naturally, if projected onto outside life and wanted there in the here and now, that is impossible. The way in which the person wants to realize the fantasy is childish, but in itself, it is valuable and has nothing wrong or unhealthy in it. So we see how that is affecting us in current affairs. So just in that undominated mad spot of the person or in the wild or problematic spot, there is a symbol of the self that gives it the drive, which is why people never know what to do for they cannot repress it. Or if they are reasonable and just give the thing up and realize how childish it is and that one should be resigned and adapt to life, then they feel that they are cured, but that they have been robbed of their best possibilities and so are frustrated. I once had an analysis who came to Europe for a Jungian analysis while his best friend went into Freudian analysis. After a year, they decided to meet again. The Freudian analysis said that he was cured and was going back to his own country, having realized all his neurotic illusions and nonsense. He was going to begin to earn his living and find a wife and marry. The other said he was not cured at all, but still very mad and in the condition of the great chaos. And though he saw this way a little bit more clearly, there was still a great deal which had not yet been solved. The Freudian patient then said that it was strange, but that though all his devils had been driven out, unfortunately, so had his angels. Very interesting. A lid had been put on the mad spot, but the religious fantasy in it of perfection, the romantic fantasy, the fantasy of the self, had also had the lid put on it, so that man will be resigned, socially adapted animal who functions, but all his romantic dreams of truth and life and real life, real love, admittedly childish fantasies in both those young men are buried too. The great difficulty therefore to return to alchemical language is to extract Osiris from the lead to save the fantasy which is life-giving and cut away the childishness of the wish to realize it. That is so damn subtle. The whole task 
is to save the nucleus, the fantasy of the self, and cut away all the childishness, the primitive desire, and so on, which surrounds it, which would mean getting Osiris out of the lead coffin. That is what the alchemist, that's what the alchemist did in a projected form when he said that the divine man had to be extracted from the lead coffin or from the corruptible matter. Uh, now I'm going to discontinue at this point um, because the next part of this um, the next part of this reading is incredibly important and interesting. And uh, I'll just, uh, let's see, I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read about half of this first paragraph of the next uh, part, just so you appreciate how important the next reading will be. I think that now we can go to an Arabic text by a man named Muhammad ibn Umayl al-Tamimi. It is sufficient to speak of Muhammad ibn Umayl because al-Tamimi, the Taman, uh, refers only to the specific Islamic tribe to which he belonged. He lived from about 900 to 960, that is at the beginning of the 10th century, according to our dates. One of his writings has been published in Arabic in the memoirs of the Asian society, Asiatic Society of Bengal, which were printed in Calcutta in 1933. According to a manuscript Mr. Stapleton found in Hyderabad, Stapleton st states that there are another hundred or so manuscripts by the same author in Hyderabad with most interesting and promising titles such as the Pearl of Wisdom, the Hidden Lamp of Alchemy and so on. But if you write there and inquire about them, you get no answer. Okay, so that is uh, just a little taste of what is to come. So, uh, this individual is later referred to as Senior uh, Muhammad ibn Umayl, uh, but in Latin he's referred to as Senior. And until 1933, nobody knew who Senior work was. So anyway, that's the beginning of the next section, which I will um, attempt to read tomorrow afternoon. Uh, I do have a two hour session in the morning. So let's see how it goes. Okay, uh, so I already read about Macbeth there, so I'm going to discontinue and uh, I'll be involved in a uh, discussion about Ezra Pound with, um, with Jordan Hoggard at 9 a.m. U.S. Eastern time tomorrow, and then hopefully I'll get into the rest of this um, chapter uh, 